Good evening. Hello. Hi, who are we speaking to? This is Daniel, but I can hardly hear you. It's really quiet. Daniel, uh, is that a bit, a bit better for you? Uh, a little bit. Okay, we'll, we'll shout, okay? But uh, yeah. w- welcome. Um, you're actually live on air at the moment um, on a college station called uh, Tux FM in uh, Tuckies in Pretoria, South Africa. Um, congratulations on your brand new al- album, uh, Neon Ballroom. Um, how does it feel, third time round? Um, we're really happy with it, actually. We're really happy with the way it came out. We're happy with the whole process. Uh huh. Uh huh. Now, um, you wanted to do things a little differently this time from uh, the first two albums, um, Frog Stomp and Freak Show. Um, what is different about this album by comparison to the first two? Well, the first two albums were very much traditional hard rock music. We'd just kind of grown up listening to Black Sabbath and Zeppelin, so, you know, still pretty young and just playing rock music because that's. You know, that's what we were passionate about. Um, with this album, it was a lot more ambitious and I really had a vision behind the album. I really wanted to do something that was different. Uh, right, right, right. Now, um, would you say the fact that um, that you guys are now um, obviously a little bit older, um, I think when you first um, had the kind of su- success that you did with Frog Stomp, um, pleasantly, um, I- I'm sure you were surprised by it, but uh, is it a little bit easier now that, uh, you know, that you are into your third album and um, used to the kind of industry uh, that you've uh, thrown yourselves into? Yeah, I think we know a lot more about the industry than we have previously. So we kind of know how to get around certain things and we know how to approach certain things. Mm. So it definitely makes it a little easier, especially being out of school now as well. Yeah, yeah, because you you, you all managed to finish up um, in 1997, so uh, you've had uh, a good, uh, well, nearly 18 months of uh, freedom. So is it it completely different for you, you know, now being sort of free agents? Um, yeah, I suppose it just gives us the freedom to really concentrate on music mm. rather than having to worry about outside educational obligations, I guess. Mm, mm, mm. But commendable that you actually finished all of that because I think uh, a lot of people in your shoes probably would have said, well, we'll come back to that you know, when we're ready, but at the moment things are looking particularly good on a, on a career front. Yeah, oh, we just really wanted to legitimately finish school mm. so we could you know, get it out of the way and so we could say we've done it. Mm. We want to become a rock and roll cliche, kind of drop out of school. We mm. just wanted to have an education as well. Mm-hmm. Now, this album, um, uh, the new album, Neon Ballroom, certainly is, um, I think, you're probably your most complete album um, so far. And as I say, not to say that the first two weren't anything but that, but um, your relationship with Kevin Shirley, he being um, an ex-South African himself, uh, working with you on Freak Show and also just uh, being involved with the mixing of this album, um, what was it like working with Kevin? Um, well, we actually did the majority of the work with Nick Warnay on this album, The yeah. Freak Show, but Kevin Shirley did our first album, Frog Stomp, yeah. and um, Nick mixed mixed the majority of uh, Neon Ballroom, mm. but we went back and got Kevin Shirley to mix two songs because we really liked his style of mixing and we thought he really suited them songs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, looking at the twelve tracks that are on the album, um, you've got a lot of different, uh, a lot of different themes. You've got some really sort of heavy in your face stuff, and you've got um, some classic balladry as well. Um, what part of the new album would you say sort of epitomizes what uh, Silver Tear are about um, in nineteen ninety nine? I think the song that really kind of sums up what the vision was behind this album with the emotion sickness both lyrically and and musically it's pretty much what I was aiming to do with the album right right and um, how are you going to be supporting this album will you be taking it uh, all over the world and playing it to uh, playing it to the world probably going possibly going into territories that you that you didn't explore on the first two albums yeah well we've got quite a lot of touring to do this year I think you know we're just going on and off pretty much the entire year mm. so we're going to try and get to as many places as we can mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, you certainly haven't been put off uh, 
put off uh, any any part of what you're doing. Um, it certainly doesn't sound like it uh, on the album. Um, are, are, are the band, uh, are you guys um, as tight as you were and uh, as together um, by comparison to, say, the last two albums? Yeah, definitely. We've, as, a, as a band, we're still very tight. We've personally kind of grown apart a little bit in terms of musical taste and mm. what we kind of are interested in. But as a band, we're as Silver Chair, we're still as tight as we've ever been. Interesting, yeah. But uh, musical styles, you, you say, having differed, um, you know, in, in, in more recent times. What is it that, uh, that you guys enjoy listening to now? Um, well, since I was 16, I've always listened to a lot of old-school hardcore music like Black Flag and Minor Threat and State of Alert and things like that. Mm -hmm. And Ben's really into the whole electronic thing like Junkie XL and drum and bass music. Mm -hmm. And Chris is really into old kind of jazz and old fiddle blues stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, there's quite an array of different musical tastes there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, um, you know, have, have you plotted your, your future um, as a band? You know, are Silverchair a band that are, you know, that, that you anticipate being around for a long time? Or, you know, have you gotten to the point that, uh, that, that you've each sort of started doing sort of side projects and wanting to do, say, something maybe a little different to what people are used to uh, from Silverchair? Um, we haven't really thought about it that much. We definitely won't be like the Rolling Stones <laughs> together when we're 40 and 50 years old. <laughs> yeah. We'll just kind of see, as soon as it's not kind of bringing it to the level of enjoyment that it should, I guess we'll stop. Mm, 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 mm. And um, if if you had to look at everything in your you know in the career that has come to you know to, to the point that it has, what would you say in your mind has been um, the best part? The best part would just be producing Neon Borum, I think, having that album come out and prove so many people wrong. Mm. A lot of people just expect us to be a one-album band. Mm. And then we came out, you know, three albums later, and I think our third album's easily our best. Mm. What, what, was it difficult, you know, when you, I mean, because the music industry and I think the media in particular are, are famous for, you know, putting bands down when they bring out that uh, that huge debut album and then you, you come in with a follow-up and, and people are ready, you know, I think when you release a debut, they, you know, they love you and they applaud you and then uh, when you come out with that second and third album, they're ready to sort of knock you about. Um, yeah, I think we kind of got around that mm. second album deal as as much as we could. Mm. There's so many bands that release a second album and then don't really get to release a third because of all the pressures. But mm. we pretty much avoid, tried to avoid that as much as we could. Mm -hmm. And uh, does does Epic give you a lot of freedom to sort of explore the, um, you know, the territories that you want to? It certainly sounds like it um, on Neon Ballroom. Yeah, they really have no part in what we do when it comes to recording and writing. Mm -hmm. They just no, they really have nothing to do with it until they hand it a copy of the album and then they kind of make the decision whether they're going to release it or not. And luckily they liked it. So. Great. Daniel, uh, my name's Rob West. I'm here in the studio with Jason. I've just got a question for you. Uh, are you looking into a uh, possibility of coming through to South Africa to come and uh, treat all your fans uh, with a few concerts down here in Southern Africa, by any chance? Yeah, definitely. When we came, when we've heard of you know South Africa before, we're just like we heard it's just really nice, and really good place to be. So yeah, yeah, we'll definitely try and get there. Any, any, you have you thought ahead of time of any uh, proposed dates within the next year, within the next five years, within the next two years? No, we haven't thought ahead. Mm. We're just kind of doing what's on the schedule. I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Which is which is good, um, but uh, we'll we'll hold you to that. We certainly would like to see you um, in South Africa. You are certainly very well supported. You've got a great fan base um, down here, and I think it has a lot to do with the with the latitude. You know, because we we sort of on the same level as it were. <laughs> <laughs> 
But um, Daniel, I'm going to ask you one last favor, if you can, before you go. Um, if you could just do an ID for us. Um, the name of the show um, that you're on at the moment is The Cutting Edge. Um, if you could play with that um, as and when you're ready. Yep. Hi, this is Daniel from Silverchair, and you're listening to The Cutting Edge. Superb. Daniel, thank you very, very much, and congratulations once again on an absolutely stunning album. Um, the album called Neon Ballroom, and the, the first single from it being big business at the moment, Anthem for the year 2000. Uh, Daniel, are you in a hurry to go, or can you hang about? Um, I can hang about for a little bit. Excellent. You do that. We'll be back with you in just a second. Cutting edge. Indeed, and live on the air, we've got Daniel all the way from where, Daniel? Uh, we're in Cleveland at the moment, America. Uh, in Ohio, I think, isn't it? Yep. There you go. And uh, are you doing doing some press at the moment, doing exactly what uh, you're doing with us at the moment? Yeah, we've just got a few interviews today, and then we play a show tonight. Stunning, stunning. Okay, um, we, we've we actually just um, played Anthem for the year 2000, the, the first single from the album. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep, it was um, inspired lyrically by a political party in Australia who were trying to impose restrictions on young people and try and keep them off the streets at certain times. So basically just a um, protest against that, uh, against taking away the youth liberation. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you, you've actually mentioned a, a track which is your favourite, um, Emotion Sickness. Um, why that particular track? Um, just as I said before, it's just what the album, the vision behind the album, that was kind of the, the pivotal song, that was what kind of inspired the rest of the album when I wrote that song. Because mm, mm, mm. I think lyrically, um, obviously there's uh, th there's been a lot of growth as well, um, as well as musically. Do, do you feel that way? Yeah, well, it's, the whole album started off being poems first. Uh, it was a whole heap of poetry, and then mm. I converted it into a more lyrical format once I decided that I liked the work. Mm -hmm. Well, stunning. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much again. Um, it's been an absolute no pleasure. Trouble. And uh, all the best with it. And I uh, hope to see you down here at some point in South Africa. We'll make sure that the sales justify that. Um, and I'm, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> but uh, thanks again for your time. All right, thanks a lot. Cheerio, then.